Hi, everybody. Welcome to the July 20th, 2018 edition of Colorado Inside Out. I'm your host, Dominic Dizzuti. Thank you very much for joining us. Let's get a quick take on Colorado elected leaders Cory Gardner and Mike Kaufman joining others in criticizing President Trump's it it trust in Vladimir Putin following his summit with the Russian president. Gardner wants to label Russia as a state sponsor of terror, and Kaufman said, quote, that Putin's Russia is not our friend. Petty Cahoon from Westward, uh, Kaufman and Gardner were not uncommon in their party. Uh, Gardner did go out on a little bit more of a limb, wanting to call Russia a state sponsor of terror. I don't know how that's going to that's gonna be a little awkward uh, next spring when Vladimir comes to town uh, in D.C., but what do you think of the reaction we saw from Kaufman and Gardner, among others? Well, and also the reaction up in Aspen, where they're having the National Security Conference right now, where Dan Coats finds out that Putin is coming to D.C., from a reporter, not from the White House, not from any other place. So During a live Q&A. During a live Q&A. So this was, you thought it couldn't get crazier, it did. Now we've got the definition of what would and would not means. <laughs> we, you know, Previously we had what is meant. So presidents have to get organized on that. Maybe Kaufman and Gardner can help him just define himself. Gardner was first lambasted for not being strong enough, but then he did come out strong. David Copel from the Independence Institute, Independence Institute and DU Law School. Uh, does what, happen be, what happens between Trump and Putin, does it belong to President Trump alone, or will it also belong to uh, Republican lawmakers like Hoffman and Gardner? Well, it depends on the response of, of the lawmakers. And let's add Michael Bennett, also Colorado's Democratic senator, who liked, didn't qu go quite as far as Senator Gardner, but had a, had a good, strong statement. What presidents say, especially when they're overseas, uh, their words really do matter and they, they do affect things. It's not just, you know, we can, in the U.S., some of Trump's early morning tweets, people just can dismiss and say, well, that's just the blather. He hasn't taken his medication yet today. Uh, but on an international stage, it, it's incredibly harmful and destructive. And it shows off to the world that he is weak and stupid and easily manipulated. And that will have very bad consequences in the long run because other hostile powers will see they can how much they can push him and get away with. Uh, he's part of a long-standing tradition of American presidents being, many of them, easily manipulated uh, by Russian tyrants. You can go back to FDR at the, the Yalta conference where uh, Roosevelt stupidly gave away a third of uh, Europe uh, to Stalin and up through uh, President Trump's predecessor. Uh, it is not hard, it turns out, for Russian tyrants uh, to manipulate narcissistic, uh, naive American presidents. It's a nice reference of Yalta. I had listened to a podcast talking about the only guy smiling in that photo is, is Stalin, yeah. so it's a good point. Uh, we have Scott Wasserman, president of the Bell Policy Center, joining us. Uh, Scott, you saw the local reactions. Uh, is that enough to separate, you think, local elected leaders from what we saw from the president this week? I don't think so, and I don't think we should be giving Senator Gardner a pass. He, he's, he did not criticize Donald Trump. Um, he continues to play games with his statements, um, and I think it's time to start looking away from the car crash that is Donald Trump and look at the bystanders who are unwilling to do anything about this president. Right uh, next door to us in Arizona, we have two senators who boldly uh, make no apologies about uh, uh, calling out this president and, and sharing their view that the emperor has no clothes. And so I think it's time for the junior senator from Colorado to step up and actually uh, uh, call this president out on, on, on hugely harmful uh, actions for this country. And Brother Jeff joins us, publisher and editor of Five Points News. It's great to have you on the panel. Good to be here. Uh, what did you think of the reaction from uh, Colorado elected lawmakers from about uh, what we saw in Russia, or excuse me, in Helsinki? Well, I think the reaction is interesting in, in, in light of the fact that uh, Trump's approval rating is at a place where they don't want to come out uh, particularly strong and risk uh, that having an impact on them. I think it's interesting that Trump went behind closed doors and perhaps he had to just take a moment to say thank you to Putin for all he's done for him. I don't know. And uh, we won't unless uh, the, first won't time, yeah, the first time I heard anyone talking about uh, subpoenaing a translator. So it, uh, subpoenaing, I'm not sure if that's a verb, but uh, we'll, <laughs> we can get that later. Let's get to it. Denver Mayor Michael Hancock delivered his annual State of the City address on Monday in which he addressed many local issues, including Denver's opioid crisis, as well as addressing gentrification in lower income communities. Hancock also announced that he will officially be running for his third term for mayor next year. Patty, state of the blank addresses are always meant to be somewhat fluffy, and they're not meant to be a whole rollout of policy. 
but this one's a little bit different because the mayor has not had a rosy time between his last day of the city and this one, and he's coming up of what will likely at least be his most contentious run for mayor uh, next May. What did you make of the State of the City address of what we heard that will have more of an impact beyond this week? Well, we're going to hear from a lot of people saying, okay, this is great, but where have you been for the last seven years? Because it's not like the gentrification problems in Colorado and in Denver happened last week or even since the last state of the city. They've been going on. This has been a trend that was already in place. It was on the edge when Hancock first took office. And that was certainly the most contentious race he's going to have unless someone else jumps in right now because you had a lot of very involved, smart candidates seven and a half years ago running for mayor and Chris Romer and James Mejia kind of knocked each other out and Michael Hancock was the last man standing but he promised to make systems work smoother. The people I've talked to who are trying to get permits from the city, wastewater, fire, they're having more trouble than they ever have. We talked about DIY spaces 18 months ago and what was going to happen for the artists who were being booted. We still haven't seen those opening. The gentrification issues and the housing, that's been an emphasis for a couple of years, but you still hear, see the tiny villages, which we can't get one to find a permanent spot or at least a semi-permanent spot so it doesn't have to move every six months. So the economy in Colorado and is rosy, but people are still peeved because they can't park in front of their house, they can't get to their house, they can't get to their job, traffic is bad, and then there's the problem that so very many of them can't afford a house here. David, uh, issues like gentrification and affordable housing, uh, I can certainly see that them being problems, issues that the community wants to rally around, but what can, or at least maybe in your view, uh, a city should be doing about what if those are considered problems in areas of the city? Well, the opposite of the Hancock agenda in many respects, he's making things worse. One of the things he said in passing in the state of the city was endorsing this bill currently before the city council by councilwoman at large, Robin Kanich, to, to basically appropriate the property of landlords, including the, the, you know, the widow who rents out three, uh, three apartments in, the, in the, the building she lives in, to say that landlords would, ha would have no choice but would have to take Section 8 tenants. That's of the federal housing program for uh, subsidized housing for certain people. The problem is lots of landlords don't want to take Section 8 tenants because, first of all, Section 8 can be very bad on paying. Somebody moves in in August, and you may not get the August rent check from the federal government till October or November. Secondly, there's no security deposit required, which, of course, comes down very hard on landlords whose property is damaged. The large majority of Section 8 tenants are good people, but the federal procedures make it very, very difficult for a landlord, especially a small guy who doesn't have a full-time lawyer on staff, to evict tenants who don't pay their share of their rent, who bring in excessive numbers of people in violation of the lease, or, or cause other problems for other tenants. So the Denver City Council should be working to try to help landlords mitigate those problems and offering some assistance which would induce more of them to want Section 8 tenants, but instead they're just going to cram it down on landlords, which will in the long run lead to landlords withdrawing their property from the rental market, selling it to build condos or, or whatever, and thus worsening the problem. Scott, on paper, Denver is uh, experiencing uh, fantastic success. It's booming. There's cranes building things everywhere. Neighborhoods that people wouldn't have walked in before are now filled with Starbucks and, and, and uh, kombucha bars. Uh, <laughs> I walked around a place in, in North Denver the same way. My buddies were making fun of that. Um, that seems like a good thing, but that's not good for everybody. How should Mayor Hancock be addressing this, which on paper seems like things are going well? Well, I mean, I think, yeah, this is a time of incredible prosperity, and not everyone is feeling that prosperity. Uh, and so those neighborhoods that you're walking in, we're, this is a time of incredible displacement for a number of communities. So, I mean, what I found really striking reading the, the state of the city was just the mayor seems to really clearly understand what all the problems are. Um, and it was almost like this uh, sort of um, 101 roadmap of the politics of Denver. And he, he pointed each of the problems I, I agree with, with Patty that's like kind of where have you been, but I think to me, I think he laid out a vision. He understands what the challenges are. Now the question is implementation, is can he get the job done? Can he find the right people? Uh, and in a city political environment, that can be very difficult. So I, I just think it's striking that he knows exactly where his opposition is coming from. 
Um, and so he sort of laid it all out. I think what's interesting is that his opposition can't unify because it's so many different issues uh, that they have with him, and he, they, he, he may very well benefit uh, from that disunity. Brother Jeff, what do you think? I mean, we're here taping this show at uh, in the historic Five Points neighborhood. Uh, in one way, it really symbolizes some of the issues that Mayor Hancock is facing. It's uh, an historic neighborhood, historically um, African American, but faced its own economic issues. And now, uh, <laughs> my 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 fellow uh, colleagues and I think about it, it would be great to live down here, but none of us could afford it. <laughs> we work at a nonprofit TV station, for goodness sake. So, uh, what do you think about what we heard from the state of the city and where Mayor Hancock has to go before he runs for his third term? Well, you know, first I got to start with this caveat by saying I like Mike. Um, <laughs> It's difficult as a black man to say things uh, when your city government is led by black people. And so sometimes they take that criticism as um, an attack, mm -hmm. as opposed to hearing the voice of citizens and how their policies are affecting them. I listened to his, his, his address and I put it in two categories, actual versus aspirational. Every time he said equity, I put that in the aspirational category. Uh, it's a great catchphrase. And listening to him say, I grew up in five points, the first thing that I thought was, as the head of this city, you're building a city that even the mayor probably can't afford to live in the neighborhood that he says that he grew up in. It was very uh, interesting to see the optics of that part of the conversation because he stood up um, a couple of aspiring business people that are, are very well respected, but they're not major land holders or major monetary players. Um, it would have been interesting if he honestly stood up Paul Books and said, this is who purchased the Rasonian. This is who purchased the Lydian. This is who purchased the public realty. And this is who purchased the pedal, the pedal shop. This is the new face of Five Points. But if he wanted to bring up a historic face, it would have been uh, Dr. Renee Cousins, who's a major landowner and business person in her own right. It was interesting to see that uh, she was absent from that presentation. So the optics kind of looked like Five Points was a historic black neighborhood, here's some black leaders, and everything's moving along fine. But the, the reality is this community is getting more upscale, more white, and more displacement every single day. That's the reality of Five Points. Governor John Hickluber signed an executive order on Wednesday aimed at handling the growing orphan oil and gas well crisis in Colorado. The order is to have all 260 abandoned oil wells in the state shut down and cleaned up by the year 2023. The plan is expected to cost a total of $25 million, and that will come from a tax charged to oil and gas companies. David, the, the path to funding this was a little tricky. Uh, trying to follow it in the different articles uh, may not have it exactly right, but what do you think of how is it fair the way this is, project is going to be paid for? I, I would say yes, um, and this executive order by Governor Hickenlooper has an advantage over some of his other recent executive orders in that this one is actually lawful because all he's, he's basically doing is he's not, you know, the governor doesn't have some unilateral magical, we're known as the president, executive order power. You can only do executive orders to direct the executive branch how to implement existing law. This one is actually based on existing law. He's basically telling the, giving some specificity to the Colorado Oil and Gas Commission in implementing a bill that the legislature passed uh, this session and that, that he signed, and it puts a tax on current oil and gas producers and to use that revenue to go and shut down and look for and inspect uh, abandoned wells, which of course the original producers aren't, didn't cause. Uh, it, it was somebody else's fault. But that, that's a, it's an intra-industry uh, tax and it's an example of how Colorado I think has a very uh, strict but fair system of oil and gas regulation. Um, and obviously abandoned wells are a hazard, so it's, uh, it, it's great that they will be found and capped. Scott, there is a potential ballot issue that would increase the setbacks for any oil and gas well from 500 feet to 2,500 feet, which would make a dramatic difference. We're already seeing ads in the oil and gas industry on TV uh, saying that this is a bad idea, and the ballot's not the, the issue is not even on the ballot yet. When you see something like this, and Governor Hickler were making a move, uh, how do you think it would affect this potential ballot issue? 
Yeah, so I think that's exactly the lens to look at this through, right? So, so the Hickenlooper model is that the end that he believes that we can work together with industry, that industry can police themselves, and that through the agreements that he can forge with industry, we can actually get in front of these problems. And we've seen that on his methane rules, and we saw this with the executive order. Um, and on the other side, and it's curious that as you look at this election, I mean, that will not necessarily be the polis approach to these issues, who's been antagonistic on these issues. So, I mean, I kind of see this as maybe perhaps, we don't know what will happen over the next few months, uh, the governor's sort of last statement on how you deal with these issues against the backdrop of a ballot measure and against the backdrop of a governor who is, uh, sorry, a, candidate, a Democratic candidate for governor who's known for a very antagonistic approach to the industry. I think uh, some of the things that need to be looked at as well are, you know, what's going to happen to the lines, not just the wells, right? And so what will happen to the lines and then what happens around liability? So there are these other issues that may or may not be handled by the governor's collaborative approach to these issues, and time will tell. Brother Jeff, did Governor Hickelooper arrive at the right solution? Well, I think it was a, a good plan to say we're getting in front of potential problems. I, I think that that's a good, a very good move. Um, when we talk about taxing, I always think about when you tax an industry or you tax a business, it still makes its way to the consumer. So uh, the general population will be paying for this in some way, uh, shape, or form. I was interested in what um, D uh, Director Tracy Bentley in the Denver Post, she's the head of the Colorado Petroleum uh, Council, and she said that the industry in some ways would ca uh, cap those wells for free, except for the fact that if you touch them, you become absolutely liable for what comes after. But she says that um, with this potential of bringing forward different regulations and, and some, some ways to look at that, that might be a way to bring the industry back into um, getting involved with this issue as well. Patty, did this, did this need an executive order from governor? Is this the right way to do it? Well, it might have been solved a different way, but certainly this capped it. A, a one part of a very contentious issue, good solution for historic issues. The question will be, with the backdrop of the ballot measure we've got coming up, which is going to be extremely contentious, with the gubernatorial race coming up, which is going to be extremely contentious, because whereas Polis is definitely tougher on oil and gas companies, I think we can safely say Walker Stapleton isn't. So at least we have the ancient wells issue settled for now. A U.S. District Court held a hearing this week regarding public use of the Rocky Flats National Wildlife Refuge. The debate is whether or not the land should be open to the public as recreation space. Many environmentalists oppose the plan, saying it is unsafe due to the land's history of producing nuclear bomb triggers. Uh, Scott, we're a ways away from an actual decision on this uh, case, but we're, we're seeing more hearings. Uh, is it that important that we have more open space land available this close to what was a former nuclear uh, uh, trigger plant when we're in a state known for its open space and we have gobs of it? What do you think? You know, I'll, I'll confess, uh, this, I moved to Colorado in 2000, so I came here kind of immediately after the high profile uh, court case around, around the site. And with this <coughs> hearing, it was actually an opportunity for me to take a, take a brief you know, tour of the history around the site, which has been absolutely uh, dramatic. Um, and so this hearing is sort of, uh, you know, sort of the last chapter in how to handle this site. And I think it's just a reminder uh, that we have to be, you know, vis-a-vis -vis what we just talked about, we have to be enormously careful around how we use land and we have to be thinking about the repercussions um, of, uh, of it for, for those who will come after. And so for me, um, as somebody who came here as a transplant, has been here for a while, it has been uh, just a fascinating, you know, um, you know, uh, opportunity to learn more about the, the history of the site. Well, Jeff, what do you think? I mean, we are making a lot of hay out of trying to use space that may or may not really need to be used right now. Well, I'll tell you, as a native, um, the words Rocky Flats has always been like saying boogeyman. There's never been a positive connotation attached to that. And I'll just ask, would you allow your children or your loved ones to go into a park area that you knew used to be a site where these um, nuclear bomb triggers were produced. Um, for me, I'm going to say no, and I'll just punt from there. No, <laughs> no, and no. And just, uh, you're in a long line of people who have punted on the Rocky Flats issue. Don't sweat that. Uh, Patty, what do you think? Uh, Westward has been covering this very well for decades. Uh, from what we've seen this week, what do we need to know? 
Well, and in fact, I was there. I toured Rocky Flats, the property, last month, and I don't think I'm glowing or have two heads, but you can <laughs> let me know if you see it. But there are things that are still very concerning about it, and it will be a beautiful open space if it's remediated and if it ever actually opens. The fact that Fish and Wildlife had set a specific date of September 15th is what brought this hearing to the forefront, because there was a date set. The big argument here is that there just haven't been enough tests and enough tests recently, and I do think that is the issue here. They need to do some more testing. Some of the surrounding municipalities now are saying we need that. No one is ever going to agree on just how safe Rocky Flats is, but we need to go one step further on the testing. David, wrap it up for us. Well, when I was the Attorney General's office, I, I briefly worked on the, the Rocky Flats issue for a little while in the, in the late 80s. Um, and more generally, I represented the clients at the Colorado Department of Public Health and the Environment, um, who part of the history of Rocky Flats is there's been a two-decade clean up there, supervised by them. Also EPA involved, but the Department of Health has been uh, very tough, and they, I can tell you those people are very highly skilled scientifically, and they are very strongly committed to when do cleanups at places like this, to getting to all the appropriate legal and scientific standards for safety. So if, if they say that it's safe, I trust their scientific judgment. And uh, later, uh this week and available online is going to be our Colorado Inside post game segment, which is always available on the website, Facebook, Twitter. We'll be covering the retirements, so not the same retirements, the stepping down of both uh, Bruce Benson and Tom Bosberg. So that will be coming up. If you're looking for what are they going, to, what's CIO going to say about that? <laughs> Check out CIO post game. Uh, for right now, it's time for our favorite part of the show, disgrace of the week. And as always, Miss Calhoun, please start us off. Well, tomorrow is a dedication of something we never thought we'd see a dedication of: the new Veterans Hospital. Um, out in Aurora. It's not quite finished though. They're not going to have all the services that they thought they were going to have ready in time. Um, this has been how many years, how many hundreds of millions of dollars delayed and it's an outrage that the veterans of this country are still not getting the services they should. David. The, another communist tyrant, uh, Daniel Ortega of Nicaragua, uh, who is murdering people in the streets, protesters, defense, defenseless, unarmed, of course, because that's how communists operate. Uh, his paramilitary thug groups and the, the, the government itself uh, directly. Same, he's now actually killed more people than the uh, Maduro Chavez regime in, uh, in Venezuela. Wow. Scott. Not to be redundant, but I feel like it's my obligation as a citizen to say that the, the, what's been so disgraceful this week is to watch uh, Congress uh, do nothing as the president uh, besmirches the country and our sovereignty. And I think it's something that every single American needs to uh, be focused on. And it's very hard to move on until, until they uh, do their constitutional job. Hello, Jeff. I'm going to Quebec Square to Famous Dave's Barbecue, a place where I've received great service, love their food. Um, Pastor Porter, on Father's Day, his church, uh, they had Famous Dave's cater for them, and their food came back with a sign on it, or it was labeled, um, Black Negro Cornbread. And so, um, Pastor Porter uh, and, and his church took offense. They went back and, and said that they were offended. And rather than Famous Dave's saying we made a mistake and talk about their labeling with the black stickers that were that they ran out of, uh, they were offended that the group was offended. And so uh, one manager even said, I can't be racist because I date a black person and I like cornbread and greens. So <laughs> with that being said, um, I'm going to throw some shade on Famous Dave's until that gets settled. <laughs> that was the only, that was the cure to being racist. That, that's all we had to do. Let's get to say something nice about somebody. Patty, you start. Well, I've said before that Denver rights would go to the opening of an envelope if it came up because sometimes they're a little starved for action. But the Target opened on the 16th Street Mall a long time coming. I mean, decades have talked, people have talked about it. I happen to love the 16th Street Mall. I think it's great that it goes through the heart of the city. And seeing people actually going and being able to shop for something useful uh, was almost worth the $4 million that we paid in subsidies. <laughs> There's targets in Lakeside saying, wait, wait a second, where's our four million? <laughs> David. Uh, University of Colorado Region Heidi Ganahl and other regents and CU students speaking up about the regents investigation about the tremendous lack of intellectual diversity at the University of Colorado. And it, it's clear that the CU has a lot of 
professors who are inferior teachers because they can't lead a classroom discussion on a pro-con dis talking about some issue in the news. Instead, they've got to indoctrinate people, which shows their own lack of intellectual ability that they have to uh, compel rather than persuade people. Mm. Scott? So uh, I wasn't here last week, but I want to uh, uh, give a shout out to those uh, those activists uh, who got the uh, Great Education Colorado ballot measure onto the ballot. Um, the uh, the proposal uh, to to raise taxes for education in the state. Um, they did it with a shoestring budget. Uh, everyone said that they couldn't do it. I think they're likely to get on the ballot, and it's just a real testament to what real genuine grassroots uh, networking looks like. Brother Jeff. Um, I'm, I'm going to go with Denver Police and say um, big salute to Chief Robert White on his retirement. I, I, I respect Chief White and I'm glad to know that he's going to stay here in, in Denver. Um, and then also, like, I think that the, the pick of Pazin as the new chief is going to be great. I've talked to a lot of people on the ground that really respect who he is. And I like some of his new moves. Like, for example, in, in my district, um, he um, promoted uh, Lieutenant uh, Kathy from lieutenant to commander. I, I like that. I like that he took Ron Thomas and made him the head over the patrol division. So I'm looking forward to um, what is built upon the foundation that Chief White has laid. Well, remember, next week we have a special treat for you. We fixed the flux capacitor and we're headed back in time to 1968 in the CIO Time Machine finale. The 1968 show is going to run next Friday at Jul July 27th at 7 p.m. and then again on August 1st, Colorado Day, we thought that'd be fun, at 7 p.m. So don't miss it. That is all time we have for this edition of Colorado Inside Out. Take CIO wherever you go. We're on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, you name it, we are there. Check out our podcast on iTunes or Google Play. For everyone here at Colorado Public Television, I'm Dominic Dizzuti. Thanks for watching. Good night.